very much. Um, so, so first, um, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Mateen, um, who is uh, an Alabama native, graduating from University of Alabama at Birmingham in 2008 with a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry. Um, during that time, she worked as a dental assistant in a periodontist office and fell in love with dentistry and periodontal surgery. She subsequently earned her dental degree from UAB um, School of Dentistry in 2012 and her periodontal certificate and master's in science in 2015. Um, upon graduation, uh, Dr. Mateen opened up her first practice, um, Auburn Periodontics and Implant Dentistry um, with her husband, um, uh, who is a periodontist slash prosthodontist. Um, she opened a second office in Georgia in 2019. Um, their passions are providing the best dental care for patients, um, advancing dentistry and utilizing cutting edge technology. Dr. Mateen serves as an assistant professor in the perio department at UAP and she also enjoys spending time with her husband and their three wonderful children. Um, and then our, our um, uh, second speaker is um, Dr. Guzman, originally from Venezuela, um, the son of a passionate endodontist. Following um, in the family's footsteps, Dr. Guzman became a dentist after graduating um, from um, the University Latina de Costa Rica in 2010 and ventured to Alabama for additional specialty education at UAB. Um, he obtained his uh, specialty certificate in prosthodontics Thank you. Um, in 2014, certificate in periodontology and implant surgery in um, 2017, and a master's degree um, in clinical dentistry in 2017, and a DMD um, degree in 2019. And during um, the years of his special training, he married um, Dr. Mateen. And not only do they um, share three children, but they um, share practices in Auburn, Alabama, and Columbus, Georgia, and um, are adjunct faculty at the UAB Periodontology Department. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Dr. Mateen. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. So today I want to tell you a little bit about why Strauman, who has always supported me since I opened my practice, has invited us as well as the American Academy of Periodontology to discuss a little bit about transitions from uh, residency to practice. So my story, I started out in residency in 2015, graduated, opened a practice by myself in Auburn, Alabama. It's a small town, great town to live in, college town, wonderful people. We have a population of 125,000. Well, my husband, we got married in 2016 and I wanted him to join the practice. So we opened a second location and that was in 2019. So I've been through a transition of opening a first practice, bring on a, bringing on an associate and opening a second location. In 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, we actually added another associate to our location who has now bought into the practice. So now Auburn Periodontics has three owners and I've gone through a practice transition and uh, have a couple of people that I work with. So I'd like to share some of my experience of what I learned in this process along the way. So the first thing, let's talk about residency to practice. So this is what you look like you're in residency. You even saw my photo that they so kindly used and with my biography, that was before children. You are young, you are full of energy, you don't have the bags underneath your eyes, but you know what, you work with a great group of people. When you transition to practice, the group changes a little bit along with the stresses in your life. So you go from here to here. And what do you notice about the differences in those pictures? First, you work with a lot more people. The second thing that you do is you have different stressors when you were in private practice versus when you were in residency. What do we have in the photo that's different? We got a pregnant lady. We got kids. We are um, in front of a, a, a bouncy house. That's one of the things we did uh, to market for one of our uh, fall festivals for the general dentist in the area. There are different things that affect you when you are a resident than when you're in practice. And I'd like to go over some of that today during this presentation. So regardless of what you decide to do, if you want to be in a DSO, 
if you want to associate in a practice, if you want to be a business owner from the beginning and open your own practice, there are some things that you need to do regardless of any of those scenarios. And some of those, especially if you're going to work at a dental service organization or join a practice, is you need to ask the employees at that location if they enjoy working there. I recently had a hygienist who applied for a job, and the first time, for the first time, I had the hygienist ask me, well, why is the position open? And I was like, oh, you never think about that, uh, but it's important for the person who is applying to understand their work environment so the person who is going to join that practice is also happy. You have to be happy in your life to be happy in your practice and the work that you do. You also need to prepare yourself, apply early, uh, have things like malpractice, life insurance, and disability insurance. And I'll go through a little bit of that today. So how can you prepare yourself? One of the best ways I think that you can prepare yourself is by understanding what type of care you're going to be administering in your practice. So one of the things that we did when I was in residency is we had a book club uh, held by Will's uh, boss over there, Eric Blasingame, and he recommended the first book that we read in this, in this study club was If Disney Ran Your Hospital. And I'd highly recommend, regardless of what thing that you were going to do after you graduate, that you read a book like this. This will help you understand how to provide superior care and customer service to your patients so that your patients remember the experience in your practice. Now, after you have Disney um, uh, run your hospital and you were great and you know how to administer that customer service, you can then start thinking about the people that you work with. And you may want to read a book like this called It's Your Ship because you want to make sure you have the right people on that ship charting the waters of the business world with you. And after you realize, you know what, I may need to throw a few people overboard. You're going to want to get a book like this. And this book is about how to have difficult conversations. And I'm going to tell you, everybody in this room is going to have to have a difficult conversation. And that is going to be either with an employee, it's going to be with a spouse, it's going to be with a child, it's going to be maybe the most awkward thing I've done so far is have to fire somebody who's twice my age because they were acting childish. There were many other reasons, but you have to be able to have those difficult conversations and it will help in all processes of this uh, uh, journey that you're about to embark on. It may be that you're an associate and you want to ask for a little bit more money. That's a difficult conversation you are going to have to have at some point if you want to raise. People do not just automatically give you those things in this world. So it's a great tool for you. So now you've got this practice that you've run with exceptional customer service. You've got everybody you want on your ship and you fired and kicked all the people off the boat that you don't want on there anymore and you started to make some money. Well, you may want to read a book like this, anything from uh, Dave Ramsey that can help you manage your money. I know that schools do not help you very much in your periodontal education or your dental education on how to manage your wealth, but I highly recommend that you start to learn a lot of the things about managing your money right now. Dave Ramsey's easy to go to. He's been around a long time. Uh, we currently use a company called Kane Waters out of Texas, and they help financially take us to the next level. I thought I was doing great. I thought I was putting money in my IRA and uh, doing whatever, whatever, and Kane Waters took us to the next level. So it's important to understand from the very beginning how you were going to plan for your retirement. And now that our business is so busy and I've got three kids, I'm on my next adventure. I want the slow and I want to grow, but I want to be able to go home at five o'clock and take my kid to soccer practice. So those are some tips on how to prepare you for the world, regardless of what transition you were going to make after your residency program. Another important thing to do is apply early. So I put February and March, but really right now you should be starting to look for your job. So where do you start to look? One of the great resources the American Academy of Periodontology has for all of us is the AAP Career Center. So you can go on there for free and look for periodontal jobs that you would like to, uh, uh, to go to. You can also just post your resume and people will find you as well. Another place that you can look for is on the ADA's website. They have created a program called ADAPT. This is a practice transition group that will, allow you, that will help you find a job and help you through that transition process. And the last place is Facebook for old people, LinkedIn. So we can, you can get on LinkedIn, have your application, and people reach out to you all the time. So this is actually Dr. Guzman's uh, LinkedIn page, and he gets invites all the time. Um, and uh, wh what did that, uh, this invite say? It said something like, uh, like, like, 
Yeah, Clear Choice is always trying to hire him, okay? So they're always trying to steal him from my practice. So LinkedIn is a great place for you to also look as well. A couple of options for you. Now, regardless of what you do when you are working, you need to make sure that you have malpractice insurance. Everybody knows here that you need to have malpractice insurance. But did you know there are different types of malpractice insurance? When I started out in residency, I moonlighted, and I was joining a dental service organization. And I thought it was so great that these people were providing me with mal malpractice insurance. Well, let me tell you what. It was claims-based malpractice insurance. That means that if somebody made a claim, the coverage is only for the policy in effect when the incident takes place and when the claim was filed. Well, I was only moonlighting for three years, and I left the company. So I had to purchase another malpractice insurance called tail coverage. Do you all know how much tail coverage costs? 200% of the policy value. So I had to purchase that in order to protect myself from this little bit of moonlighting I did on the weekends. <clears throat> so the most ideal coverage that you can have is something that is uh, occurrence-based malpractice. Of course, I just wanna let you know that I'm not a financial planner. I'm not a financial advisor. I am full of hot air and I'll tell you uh, whatever I wanna say. So I'm gonna give you my recommendations, but it is not based, uh, it's based on my experience. So occurrence-based malpractice is great because it gives you coverage for incidents that occur during your policy year as well as when the claim is reported. In the state of Alabama, somebody has seven years to report a malpractice claim, okay? Now, you may ask, where should I get my malpractice insurance? Guess what? The AAP helps you with that too. In the AA Career Center, as well as in a booth, you can go talk to Trelor and Heisel, and they can help you get a malpractice policy through MedPro at a discounted rate. This is actually where we have our policy, which is nice. So if you are thinking of starting or uh, joining a DSO or working, start talking to Trelor and Heisel about your malpractice insurance. The next thing you need to, to talk about is life insurance. This is something that is so different with our generation. The older generation, the first thing wanted to do when they graduated from college is go out and get life insurance to support their family. Well, it is still important these days to have life insurance. And there is no excuse for anybody in this room not to have life insurance because the American Dental Association provides it for you at no cost. And there's no application and there's no medical exam for $50,000 worth of coverage. Now, as a disclaimer, I did sit on this council for membership insurance and retirement programs with the American Dental Association. So I very encourage every single person to apply for this because we had two claims a year from dental students uh, with life insurance. So it's very important for all of us to have the appropriate coverage. And when you graduate, it doubles to $100,000, y'all, with no, no application, no medical exam. So it's something so easy for you to have. Currently, one of my policies is a $375,000 policy with uh, Protective, that's the ADA insurance provider, and it only costs me $8.03 per month. So there's no excuse not to have something like this, and it's ease of access, so I'm trying to share that information. All you have to do is go to insurance.ada.org or ada.protective.com in order to get your uh, um, life insurance and disability policies. So that's life insurance. The next thing is disability. Disability, there are different types of disability that you may need to have. One is disability income protection. That's if you become disabled, you need to have insurance that's gonna pay you every month. Uh, my policy has a very short waiting period because I have been um, pregnant so much lately. I have three kids and I had them in the past five years. So if something were to majorly happen and I was out in the business, I wanted to make sure I could cover uh, my loans. So my policy, $365 a month. At age 36, I have no medical conditions and that pays out $7,000 a month. A second type of insurance you may not know about if you are thinking about opening a practice is office overhead protection insurance. This is if we are out and you were out for six months, your staff's not gonna sit and wait for you. The staff also has family. They have their husbands and their kids they have to pay for. So this office overhead protection plan will allow you to, um, uh, uh, to pay out and cover overhead expenses. And another important thing nobody told me is don't pay out of your business account. Okay, you need to pay out of post-tax money, so pay out of your paycheck. So if you're paying uh, any of your life insurance or your disability insurances, make sure you're paying them out of a post-taxed paycheck, like, like your regular paycheck. And that is so you don't get taxed later on. Just small things I wish people had told me. So that's really transitioning in general from residency to practice. 
Let's talk about some other options. Let's talk about if we're going to do something like a DSO, a dental service organization, for example. What, dental service organizations have become very, very smart. They don't call themselves dental service organizations. They call themselves dental support organizations. And they're here to support you. They're here to support you financially. They're here to support you clerically. And they're here to provide managerial services so you don't have to hire and fire those employees. Um, and if you will see over here, 10% of us are going to be part of dental service organizations. I myself was one of them. There's nothing wrong with being a, a member of a DSO. That number is growing and growing. But I do wanna talk a little bit about my experiences there. So how am I gonna get paid? How are you gonna get paid as a dental service organization employee? You can get paid by salary. So I just Googled over here and I said, okay, ZipRecruiter, what's my salary if I work in Alabama? So you see, if I'm a periodontist in Alabama, I should on average be making about $193,000. I say this because you do need to do research in when you apply for a job. And you need to say, okay, I need to be making at least $193,000 if I work in Alabama. And the number one thing that women do not do, and I mean some men as well, is they never, they never stand up for themselves enough to say, okay, you know what, I need to be making 193. So the offer for 145,000, it's great, I appreciate it. Um, the average, according to uh, uh, my research, really is that we're supposed to be making $193,000. And you know the worst thing that anybody can say in that situation? The worst thing is just no. And I tell my staff members that. The girl who orders for me, she is 22 years old. And she asks trauma and every single time I put an order in for a discount because what's the worst thing you can say? No, we're not doing a discount right now, Dr. Medine. Okay, next time. Or how many more do I need to order in order to get 20% off? You know, you need to learn how to do those things uh, if you're gonna uh, run a practice. Okay, so salary is one of the ways that you can earn money and make money. What's another way? You can get paid by a daily rate. So I did get paid by a daily rate in the office that I moonlighted. And that daily rate, I think, was $700. And if you calculate that, if I worked a 50-week year, uh, I'd make like $150,000. So you can get paid on a daily rate if you're working for a dental service organization, or you can get something called a percentage of collections. This is the number one way that periodontists as associates, either in a DSO or in a private practice, are paid. Percentage of collections. It's not how much you produce. So in the clinic, you charge out a code for a cleaning for $200. Okay, well, if the front desk only collects 150, because the patient, that's all they brought in their pockets that day, and their credit card or their flex spending was maxed out, then you're only gonna get 40% of the 150. You're gonna get $60 that day. You're not gonna get the $80 of the 40% that you completely produce that day. So it's important to understand what percentage of collections means as, a, uh, as an associate. Now, when I did work for a DSO, this is what my life was like. I was tan, I wore my aviators, I got my bicycle in the back of the car, and we're headed to Callaway Gardens for a holiday weekend. It was great. I didn't have to worry about anything. I went to work, I had a stable income, and then I went home, I didn't have to worry about anything. It was so wonderful. But where was my room for growth? What did I have to do beyond that daily rate of $700? How much more was I gonna be able to provide for my family? So those are some of the disadvantages maybe of working for a dental service organization. The other thing, <laughs> you never know who you're gonna have sometimes working with you that day. And sometimes you're gonna get this, this radiograph from an assistant who has transferred from the Montgomery office and they're helping you that day. And the girl just cannot take a radiograph. And it's very frustrating. And some of us who have worked for DSOs understand this. So you can't hire and fire that employee. That's out of your control. You just gotta get up and go over there and help her take the radiograph the right way that day. So that may be a disadvantage of working for a DSO as well. <clears throat> and you may not always be able to get the time off uh, whenever you want to. It's not like pretty woman. You don't get to say who, or you don't get to say when, and you don't get to say who. You have to say yes, sir. <laughs> so the next thing I did, we did the DSO thing. You know what? It was pretty cool. I had a lot of fun. I made a little bit of money. I was able to vacation whenever I wanted. I said, you know what? We're going to open a practice. And that dental service organization, I learned a lot. 
I learned a lot about how to manage an office, work with people. I also learned about the different types of setups. So I worked in, I don't know, 12 different locations and every location had a different delivery system. I had rear delivery, side delivery, uh, chair delivery, all different ones. I was able to figure out which one worked for me. And that was great. That helps me when I opened the practice. I also went up front and I was nosy. How do you file a claim? What does it mean to file a claim? What do you need on that? Where does the code go? How does the computer work? Those types of things are very important and a DSO can help you with that information. Also, the American Dental Association, they have a, a new practice checklist. So if you were thinking of opening an organization, the first thing I did is I printed this off. The new practice checklist has a lot of information. It helps you uh, about setting up your business. It helps you decide which business structure may be best for you. It helps you decide what tax structure. It helps you with hiring and firing of employees and your regulations in your area. It also helps you with building an office design. This checklist is a very inclusive checklist. One thing that was on here I forgot to do was uh, my radiographic equipment um, uh, evaluation with the state. And thank goodness I looked at the checklist before uh, we opened because I needed to have that before I actually saw patients. OSHA compliance, HIPAA compliance, all of this is provided to you by your parent organizations. Now let's go through these a little bit more in detail. Let's talk about a dental rep. If you're opening a practice, what is a dental rep going to do for you? You know what? The dental rep is always out looking for places that are open. They are going to be able to tell you, okay, uh, you want to practice, Auburn's a great place to go. I hear all the dentists in the area need a periodontist. So that's what happened. They were like, hey, you know what? Auburn really needs a periodontist. I said, that is great. I want to go back home. I want to see my family. They also help you with equipment. Uh, and they help you uh, decide what equipment to use and how to map out your office. They help you talk to the dentist. So before I opened my doors, October 1st, 2015, that uh, Patterson rep at the time was in all of the dental offices saying, hey, you know, this lady's coming. You wanted a new periodontist, she's on her way. She's gonna be here in October, so you better be ready. You want me to get a referral pad for you? The dental reps can help you in many, many different ways. They also can help you with office design. So this is one of the designs for one of our expansions. They help you actually map out what space, and they help you be educated about that. So I said in my first office, I want the biggest room. I said, I want all the space. I want to take the wheelchair around here. I want to take the wheelchair around here. I want to be able to do whatever I want in my surgical operatory. And the dental rep said, uh, are you forgetting the x-ray tube only goes out seven feet? So, oh, okay. <laughs> we'll make them a little bit smaller then. <laughs> so the x-ray tube actually fits where all the patients can have their radiographs. That's very important. Something I didn't think about. All I wanted was all the space in the world to put that wheelchair uh, to fit in the room. The next thing they'll do is they'll also do a breakdown. So all the equipment, I have a, a sample example of how much I spent. Each room cost about $40,000 to build out. So I opened my first practice that, that had a sterilization room. I had two rooms. I had radiographic equipment. It cost me $150,000 for my dental service rep. Those numbers really haven't changed a whole lot over the past seven years. And then they help you do a breakdown of your cabinetry. So this is stuff I would never know uh, how to do by myself. So a dental rep is very important. Another important person is to have a loan officer. So when you're applying for a dental loan, I was all freaked out I wouldn't get this loan. I said, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to get it. I have $354,000 in debt. I'm sure a lot of us in the feel that same pain. The loan officer said, say, honey, listen, I am supposed to tell you this, but I'm going to just tell you, calm down, first of all. It's going to, if you have less than $500,000 in debt, you got a credit score, 700 or more, and uh, you have less than $35,000 in credit card debt, then you shouldn't really have too hard of a problem getting um, a dental practice loan. And you know what? That has stayed pretty much true over every single loan and refinance I have done. The big banks as well can help you with this. They have dental specialty departments. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, PNC, and Provide. I have worked build outs, new purchases, and refinances with all four of these banks. Some are easier. Some are a um, little more difficult, but may have a better interest rate. Whoops. That's, <laughs> I, hope, I hope that wasn't my nomad. <laughs> uh, anyway, so all the banks that can help you with the dental, uh, dental loans. The next person you're going to need is a real estate agent. Either if you want to build a practice or you want to lease a space, you still need to use a real estate agent. So how many people here rent 
rent a, an apartment right now. Okay, so you pay a base rent. You go in, you have uh, 678 square feet, and the rent's going to be you know, $1,600 a month. Okay, that's similar to what you do in a commercial lease space, but they also may have something called CAM. That's Common Area Maintenance. So when you're leasing a commercial space, you're going to have your real estate value per square foot of that space, but you're also going to have commonly shared expenses. Like who's going to cut the grass? Who's going to trim the bushes? Who's going to fix the toilet uh, when it breaks? That is what that common area maintenance uh, is for. You also need to make sure that you have ease of access to the place. But something nobody told me except my dental Patterson rep, and thank God he did, is that you need to uh, ask for tenant improvement money. What people don't tell you is that commercial landlords love dentists. You know why? You're going to put your chair there in that dental operatory space, and you're going to stay for another 25 years. So you are a great tenant. We don't have a lot of parties. We don't cause a lot of trouble. We may use a lot of water, but that's about the worst thing that you see us do. So we're great. And if we build out a dental space in that uh, uh, lease space, we are going to improve the value of his property. I'll give you an example. Tiger Town. Tiger Town uh, just is, is a commercial space in Opelika, Alabama. And one of the dentists said, okay, I'm ready to build my practice. She took all of her equipment out of that lease space and put it into a new space. Within 10 days, a new dentist had already leased the space that she just left because it was plumbed properly and set up properly. We are great investments. We're great investments for insurance people because, you know, we don't really smoke. We're great ins investments for uh, uh, commercial real estate people because we don't really move. We stay in one place for a long period of time and we're not too rowdy. So it's good, it's good for those types of things. So ask for tenant improvement money. If you can't get tenant improvement money while you're building your practice, ask for free rent. And the worst thing they can say is what? Yeah, I've never had anybody say no though. I had one that offered me $25,000. On another space, they offered me $100,000 in my construction costs. And the other offered me eight months of free rent. So all of this is very important to ask for. And what you do when you want to rent a space is submit a letter of intent. So that's an example of a letter of intent of saying you want to rent a space. Now, what is great is that there is a company now, Car Healthcare Realty, that will do all of this work for you and they build the actual landlord uh, in order to do it. If you were looking to purchase a space or lease a space, Car Healthcare Realty are really down to earth guys. I do not work for any of these people. I just um, have seen them in the passing and had friends work with them. And I just wanna let you know that they have really found a special place in the dental market to help us out. So that's just a little tip for y'all. Then you may need a lawyer. They're going to tell you you're going to be an S corporation or an LLC along with your accountant. Uh, it cost me when I filed my paperwork $400. The reason I say this is I was in a lot of y'all's position right now, and I was taking it out of my student loan money in order to pay for these things. So it cost me $400 to file my paperwork. I had somebody look over my lease. It cost me $1,500 to do that. And then I also met with the lawyer's office to say, okay, I don't want to get sued by an employee. When I sit him down, for an interview. What can I ask them? And you know what? They helped me in that process because when I see a young girl sit down and she's twiddling her wing finger and she just got married, I can't say, hey, you, did you just get married? No, you cannot say that. You know what you can say? You can say, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. Say, oh my God, I just got married. I think I'm going to have kids, you know, next year. And, you know, that's the stuff, the information you want to have in making an employment decision without actually asking those questions. Then you can have an accountant as well. Uh, they're going to help you with a lawyer, develop your tax structure, file your tax paperwork, and help you with something like QuickBooks. This helps you manage your business structure. And it's important to actually understand how QuickBooks or whatever software you're using uh, to be able to pull information and data from it. And then they help you with payroll services as well. If you don't have an accountant who can help you with a payroll service, the American Dental Association also has a payroll service company at a discount you can use, and they're used to filing payrolls for dental offices. So just a little tidbit there. And you need a mentor because you need all the help you can get. You got to have a contractor. These are the slowest ones out of everybody. Uh, they're going to give you a bid for your project. They're going to uh, help you create your dental space. And to build out 1,600 square feet, no, it's 20. 2,500 square feet was about $2,000. That was back in 2015. 
We're building out an 1,100 square foot space, half the size, and it's costing $300,000. So times have changed just a little bit in construction costs, uh, but they will help you with that. And it's important to be able to communicate with your contractor. Now this right here is the most <laughs> expensive two lines. So this person just works with a contractor, does the build out, and you write them a check for $16,000. <laughs> but they help you in that build out process. Then you, uh, I used a designer. They helped make it nice and fancy. This is a picture of our office. So you can see it has a nice semi-transparent structure over the sterilization center. So the patients know we've got a sterilization center, but they don't see all the dirty. So it's somebody can help you build out all the tile, all of the uh, fixings for the, the office. And I actually thought that my dental designer helped a good bit. And they do cost anywhere from $7,000 to $15,000 to do so. And you need an IT specialist. They help with your computers. They help you HIPAA encrypt your email, all the things that you find in that ADA checklist and HIPAA uh, uh, training book. They help you with phones. Phones nowadays are often networked uh, with data. They aren't necessarily the phones that use a phone line anymore. And they help you with your data cabling in your office, making sure everything can be connected. And a lot of them work with your website and even if you want to do SEO marketing. Then you've got to actually recruit the patients to pay for all the bills that you just spent on all these people. So how are you going to do that? Well, the number one thing you can do is visit dental offices. But what you should not do is go unannounced. There is nothing I hate more in my day than when somebody shows up unannounced. So I like to make sure, I'm not getting out of my office to go see, you know, uh, Anyway, to see somebody if they are not uh, uh, announced, because I got stuff I got to do. I got to pay all the rest of the bills in the practice. So if you're going to go around and meet the new people, make sure at least to let them know. And you know what? You can do a lunch and learn as well. You can say, hey, I'm going to come see you. I want to introduce myself to you, and I'm going to bring all your ladies lunch. What do they like to eat? And sometimes that answer is going to be Taco Bell, and sometimes it's going to be the hound. So you're going to have, you know, $5 a plate or $20 a plate. It's going to happen sometimes. The other most successful thing that I've had is dinner with dentists. Do you all remember dentistry is such a lonely profession? The dentists that are in private solo practice, they don't have anybody to talk to, right? They're not going to be able to explain why the threshold compression of that porcelain fractured on the number six because it was I'm, uh, Emax and it was not, you know, a zirconia, blah, 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 blah. Okay, they can't they can talk to their staff members about that. But if you go to dinner with them, it opens it up and all they do is talk dentistry. What have y'all been doing this whole weekend? Probably talking about dentistry the whole weekend. So having dentures with the dentist really helped me develop those close relationships. Then having something like an ITA or a SPEAR or a Seattle Study Club also was a helpful thing for our office. You want to put out advertisements sometimes, and you can use the yellow pages, although that's really antiquated. Uh, you can have patient seminars direct to the public and use social media. And don't forget to register as a, on Find a Dentist with the ADA website. But marketing these days are so much different than in 2015. So if we talk marketing, what does it look like? Marketing looks like this. It's Instagram, right? If you want to go direct to the public, you're using social media to do it. If you aren't using billboards as much anymore. You can but it's not the yellow pages. We're using Instagram. We're using things like everywhere TikTok. Everywhere you look, everywhere there's a place of somebody who needs you. Everywhere you look, when you're lost out there and you're all alone, life is waiting to carry you home. Everywhere you look. I know what that song is. I think I realized that uh, I played this for a group that probably never, never watched Full House. No, it was, it was a great show, okay? It was a great show. Uh, you also, one other thing I did in my practice is I took my digital printer, or one of them, and I put it in the patient waiting room. And you know what? While the patients are sitting there, they can watch HGTV if they want to so that they can see where else they're going to spend their money, or they can watch my printer print. And it's like being at a science museum. And they're like, oh, that's so cool. And you know what else you find out in those environments? You find out that a lot of people are in 3D technology. And they'll say, hey, we use printers at the credit card processing plant. Or we use printers at a NASA, blah, blah, blah. It's really great to open another door of communication with your patients. Or you can do things like this. This is a neat project that Strauman supported us with. This is called Boot Camp. 
So Strauman supported us a four lecture series because the dentists in our area were not familiar with all on fours or the um, uh, implant hybrid restoration. So what we did is we had a hands-on lecture. We had four lectures educating them on treatment planning, on which patients are best, or bring a patient you think would be a good patient, we'll review why it's good and it's not good. And you know what? We're gonna convert a temporary hybrid in the, um, uh, at the community center. So we did, and Strauma supported us with that, and that's so important. Without people like that, you wouldn't be able to get where you're supposed to get. You have to work with all kinds of people. Another thing that I did is that I don't like you know, I'm a, I'm a millennial, so they always say we're very emotional people, and that's very true. If you ever talk to me, I only have, like, this extreme emotion or, you know, I, um, I'm not always just, I'm not a very calm person. And so I like my impacts of information to also be that powerful for the patients. And so when a patient tells me that they are smoking or they're dipping, and I say, okay, you got to quit. No, we can do better. I have a MacBook. I can do something with that and provide the patient with better information. spent my whole life smoking until I was 16 and I, I had a stroke. tried to quit smoking, but until the, the stroke So it is a bit dramatic, but it gives you that, that information in such a more powerful way. I mean, I have chill bumps looking at her. You know, she's this direct impact of what we tell our patients every day, stop smoking, stop smoking. That gummit stop smoking, because this is what's gonna happen. And they can actually see it. Other ways that I did marketing, I went out and I was like, hey, I'm a new periodontist, and I'm gonna use all these regenerative techniques. I'm going to use Indigain. I'm going to grow the regenerative defect that's on the mesial of your first premolar. And I'm going to use a growth factor to do so. And the dentist is like, yeah, growth factor? Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we show them what we're actually doing? So when I went around to those lunch and learns, I actually would show them what it meant to, uh, to have these advanced regenerative techniques in practice. And I would explain, okay, this is what a growth factor does. This is where a cell goes through a blood vessel, okay? And you've got a site of injury, aka the surgery site. And what happens, that red blood, blood cell attaches to the wall of the site of injury first. And what's, it's gonna get it to stop bleeding. You know what else it does during that stage? It's gonna tell, hey, let me get my fibroblast friends over here and let's start this regenerative process. These are what growth factors do. They modify that signaling process. And how do I apply it to a patient case? Well, make sure you're documenting your case in practice, in residency as well. And you're gonna say, okay, we're gonna use this growth factor to regenerate a major case. This patient presented, he was a military man, he was in a car wreck, hit his front teeth, and went off to tour for a year, came back with severe defects. How are you gonna throw that back? Well, I'm not just packing bone. I can't just pack and pray. 
So what we've got to do is use advanced surgical techniques. Now, I will tell you this video is a little older, so I'm using some older technology. Uh, so for this defect at the time, I was using BMP. So I used BMP with allograft particulate. If I were to do this today, I would use something like TRF. It's cheaper, faster, stronger, better, longer. <laughs> but this is what we used at this time. Worked great. I shouldn't really talk down TRF on uh, BMP. So we packed the regenerative uh, material in the defect space. And then I excited a titanium membrane. Also something I probably wouldn't do today, you know what I would use? I use a pericardium in this space, in this situation now, and I'd pack it. Because of the removable membrane, it's so much better than a titanium membrane. So we didn't have all of that technology way back in 2015. So we fixate the membrane, hold the bone graft there. And the next thing, and the most important thing for bone grafting surgery and vertical ridge augmentation is to make sure we have proper closure. So I need to make sure the soft tissue heals properly. So now, for all my earthy patients, I'm going to use your own blood. I'm going to spin it in the centrifuge and get out the stem cells, buff it, and everything else I need to do, put on that soft tissue and make sure it heals properly. So we apply that at the time PRP. tissue properly closed in a site like that. And you know what? Now you don't have to send your bone graft to oral surgeons. You send them to all periodontics, okay? So it's important information for them to be able to see all the things that you can do. So that worked very well for marketing in our office. Now, I am going to turn over because I've given you all my experiences. I've worked at a DSO. I've opened a couple of practices. I have hired an associate. I'm going to let the associate, who is now a business owner, go through the next part of that process. Oh, excuse me, sir. So by now, I'm sure all of you, you know, grasp this concept. And because this is so easy, that's why, you know, everybody starts up a, a practice. So this, this feeling you have, you might have right now, it's what general dentists feel every time you speak. And when you go lecture, they'll be like, what, what are they talking about? It's like... Anyways, it's, it's a lot, it's worth it. So uh, private practice, um, when you transition as a, as a resident, you have a couple of uh, options and being the associate uh, or at the associateship, it's, it's what you could think of uh, the dating period, you know? Um, this is basically a dentist that is not the owner that works in a dental practice. You can be a W-2 employee, which means you are, um, you have a salary, you might have percentage of collections too, uh, you get all the benefits and life insurance, all the stuff that the practice provides you, uh, or you can be an independent contractor. Uh, for example, I'm a W-2 employee of our practices, but also I play, you know, once a month with uh, one of my mentors, uh, Prosodontist, she works with three other prosthodontists in Birmingham, and I, I just travel and, and do surgery for them, and it's just, just for fun. So at that office, I would be a W-9, uh, you know, independent contractor. Um, but you have to think now, if you want to buy a, a practice, is it worth it? I know it's very difficult uh, coming out of practice, but it is worth it. You have to, you got to keep track if you're going to do it in two or five years. The longer you wait to decide to become an owner, the worse it is. It's like investing on your retirement. If you work as an associate for 10 years, 15 years, you will make, you know, I don't know, $5 million less than your classmate that, that said, like, I'm going to do it. I know it's scary, but I'm going to do it. So all you have to do is pick the time when you think you have learned enough uh, business-wise to take that step. If you have somebody that is bringing you for the dating part, which is the associateship period, uh, that really you know wants to eventually buy them out, then and have that support, that makes it the best, obviously. So when you look at a practice, they're trying to hire you. You're brilliant. Have all the newest techniques. You might be going to a place that is not New York City. You might be going to a, a little bit less urban area, uh, and you know things. This, this periodontist that is practicing has no idea. So maybe that this period practice only those classic perio, and you, you place implants. You do bone grafting, things they, they do not do. Uh, 
the longer you're practicing as an associate, the more that value of that practice. So it can be a million dollar practice and you practice there as an associate for 10 years and make it a you know, $5 million practice and you're like, okay, I wanna buy in. So you, not, you need to know from the beginning if you wanna buy in and talk to this person you're about to start dating and set some terms in writing. Uh, it might be at a year, at two years, whenever you, whenever you consider you will be ready to take that step of becoming an owner, you have to set it in writing and uh, it might be, you know, at two, after two years of working for you, I would like to be able to buy in, become a partner, and maybe, maybe you will practice for five more years, and I will buy the rest of the practice, and you will be, become my employee for maybe five more years, and then you're out. Uh, if you have a practice, you, the average amount of time it takes for you to get a partner is 10 years. So you don't start looking at, in this room for the, the next generation when you're 65. You gotta start early. Uh, you can always you know, sell your practice and just enjoy your life and still do your surgeries and, and be a, an independent contractor. So uh, you gotta find, look in this, uh, the practice, is the, is the equipment okay? Do you like the location? Uh, do you think the staff uh, is good? Does your family like that area? There are many, many things um, that are in there. So make sure you start looking for a job very early. There are many websites like Dr. Martin mentioned. Uh, you can start at the local level, the, the dental districts of each area, wherever you're gonna live, they're gonna have a, an ADA chapter of dentists. You can ask in that area, uh, what's the need for a periodontist? And they will tell you, hey, we don't have any periodontists like here. So if you, if you do that, instead of living in Miami Beach, you are gonna kill it. You know, you can just fly to Miami Beach every weekend and party, and you don't have to like live in there and, and struggle, you know, with all the clinicians. Anyways, uh, so look online, the AAP has a career center, the ADA also has a career center. As of last, uh, this Sunday, sorry, there were 143 job postings at the AAP. This is Sunday night after uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, ADA has, sorry, I can't read that. Uh, it happens when you get to, when you're 40, you can't read that font anymore. 34 or 40 something. Uh, if you go to uh, Zip Recruiter, this is, I just put Dallas, Texas. I don't plan to move in there, but I was just curious. There are 28 jobs just in Dallas, Texas. Uh, it tells you the average. They make, you know, more money in Dallas, Texas than in, in Auburn, Alabama. I mean, the average salary. Uh, there are other places. Indeed, a lot of normal people that are not in dentistry use Indeed. You know, secretaries, whatever. Everybody posts a resume in Indeed, and they use Indeed a lot. So it's it's a good site uh, to look for for jobs. Uh, there are, what is that? Let's say I don't. I can't read that. Sorry. Let's say eight, ten jobs. This is just New York City. Um, and also the companies that sell you equipment, I just went into Henry Shine and look and there are like eight pages of, of, of jobs if you type just periodontist. So there is enough job postings to, to hire for you all to get two jobs if you wanted to right now, if, if we have 150 people here. Uh, you can always uh, call the doctors in the area, introduce yourself, ask your upperclassmen, uh, ask your program directors. Uh, they always get, you know, people that graduated 10 years ago, they're like, hey, Dr. Gers, you know, we're looking for an associate. If anybody asks, you know, send them our way. So there are many ways to find that associateship. But just like in normal relationship, the dating part is easier than the marriage part. Um, joining, you know, you have to evaluate that, that day, dating time to see if you actually want to propose to this person and want to marry it. This is going to be a person you're marrying, you're the owner of the practice. You're marrying them and it's just strictly business. So there is no, you know, no love, no kids, nothing else binding you to this partnership except finances. And finances are a main reason of friction, you know, even in marriages. A lot of people get a divorce because it can be just spending habits. So you need to look at your partner to see if this is a person, you know, that's spending too much money on equipment or whatnot. Uh, but in this time, you know, you already worked at this practice. You see if you liked it. Uh, maybe you like the staff. See who you need replacing. 
Uh, maybe you evaluated the referrals of the area, see if you kind of like the area, if, uh, if they work well with you. Uh, if your family like the area, maybe your kids, you know, miss the snow and you don't want to live in the south or something like that. Uh, and definitely the relationship you have with this owner. Has this owner support, supported you uh, to become the next partner? Um, in the past, I've been in meetings like this, and, and I remember one in 2014 when the, the person said that it's important in this associateship phase when you talk to the owner to make sure they, they're willing to support you that year that you might be investing in there, one or two years before you decide if you want to buy in. They need to introduce you to all the referrals. They need to pay for those lunches. They need, they need to pay for the lunch and learns. You know, you're just out of school. You don't need to be taking this bill. Uh, if they're willing to do that, those are good signs. You know, they're not just putting you in there to increase the value of the practice and they make way more money of you as an associate. Uh, that, that's not their purpose. They're trying to really, you know, bring you in, that make you part of the team so that, that you succeed. Uh, so those are things to look in the person you're looking. Uh, and then the partnership is part of the marriage. That's not how you fold the towels. 80% it doesn't matter how you fold the towel. It does matter how fail. you fold the towel. If you want it to fit in the closet, you have to roll it. Oh my God, could you chew any louder? This goes on here. It takes two seconds. Well, then the next person who comes in, we'll do it. That's not the point. Hey, did you throw away my leftovers? No. I could have... Oh, you bitch. What did you call me? Nothing. The toilet paper goes over. It's printed that way so you can see it. No, the toilet paper goes under so that the cats don't get at it. That makes no sense. What do you want to get for dinner? I don't really care. Then just pick something. You choose. Told you. Shut up. I don't see why I have to put the utensils face down. Because when they're sticking up like that, if someone trips and falls, they're gonna impale themselves and die. That's literally the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I'm not playing this game where I list every single thing and you shoot it all down. I'm not doing this again. Well, then I don't know what to tell you. Oh my gosh, watch this. This is the best line. Did you watch this without me? You weren't home! Seriously, six more inches and it's in the sink. Well, then put it in six more inches. <sighs> I get it. I get it. Anything will be fine. It's fine. food. Fine. All right, we're gonna get pizza. Anything but pizza. What do you want to eat? That is Bill Paxton. It is Bill Pullman. Bill Paxton was in Aliens. That is Bill Paxton. That is him. Game over, man. That is that man right there. Why am I going to put him away? I'm wearing them tomorrow morning. I don't care if you're wearing them tomorrow morning. I don't want them just sitting by my side of the bed all night. Why do you do this? You squeeze from the bottom. The next person doesn't have to squeeze then. It's toothpaste. It's not like it's hard to squeeze it from a new area on the tube. Why are we fighting about this? Why are we fighting about this? I, why are we fighting about this? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have made you make the decision. That being said, I think your original call of pizza is fine. Just no pepperoni. So there's a lot of compromise we all have to make in relationships and especially in, in the business ones. Um, you have to be able to communicate, you know, keep it clear so that that friction over time doesn't become, you know, a rash that you keep getting friction and and you end up with leprosy like, you know, the king in, in Game of Thrones. You'll know what happens when it, leprosy gets that advanced. Uh, so the benefits of an associateship, uh, I'm sorry, of becoming a partner, you know, when you travel, uh, those are office expenses, things like that. Uh, you have a salary that you don't have to say that your salary is, you know, I don't know, $600,000. You can make your salary smaller to whatever, you know, financial advisors will, will advise you on that. That's why it's good to, to get one uh, so that your salary is something reasonable. Uh, but because you're an owner, you have all this profit that needs to be split between the partners. So, you know, there's a tax bracket for, for you as a professional and there, there's a tax bracket as a business owner that is sometimes way less. And, you know, that money is yours and you need to take it out. So your actual real salary is not what 
anyways, what the salary is. So um, very good, very important to have an external group to help you with the transitions. We use NDP uh, out of Texas. They, they were recommended by uh, Kane Waters. This is a list of things uh, they will request. So if you are computer savvy, if you're a female and young, you, you have all this. She had all this. At a, you know, open the laptop, had it all. Uh, I don't know where to find these things. Uh, so you get a partner that knows how to do things. You know, uh, I only know teeth. And then after this transition is done, then you get you know the person that you really liked and that you dated for two years, and you establish, hey, at two years, we're either getting married or not getting married, and they help you, you know, get married. And uh, they have to evaluate the practice, and you know they charge us around maybe it was ten thousand dollars, and after that they give you two cups. So when you're feeling down, you make coffee with these two cups, and it's like you know a five thousand dollar cup of coffee, and it's it's okay, it makes you feel better. So uh, the ownership in private practice is on a downtrend because of what Dr. Martin just showed you is it's just a lot of things that you need to learn and need to be able to to say I'm gonna do this and get all the checklists and just map it out as a crime scene on the walls so you can get all the things done and not overwhelmed and uh, get your loans and get things started or find somebody that, that really wants to mentorship, uh, mentor you and bring you in. That, that makes it way easier because that person will teach you what to do, what not to do and tell you, hey, I did this for the first five years and you know, didn't waste it half a million dollars for doing things this way. That's why we do it this way and it's, it saves you time. Uh, and money. Uh, because you're young, you can also complement the practice, adding services that maybe they're not periodontis, uh, periodontal services. In this case, again, you can go to a remote area where they don't place implants. You place implants, the practice value skyrockets. Uh, I mean, skyrockets. Uh, you can you know, take a weekend course and do this better than anybody, do fillers and Botox. Uh, you will be amazed how you know, there's no patients missing maintenance because they can tell, you know, the wrinkles are coming back and they are coming for their cleaning, you know, and getting their Botox in, in two minutes. Uh, you can bring in a spe another specialist. Uh, in my case, you know, they brought a prosthodontist uh, just, just in case. It could be an endodontist. You know, you, you can be the best at doing regeneration, but if you don't have an endodontist in your area, you are uh, out of luck, you know. Um, also, you can plan to have adding a lab maybe to your practice. So when you do your plans, set a little space for lab because a lab could be just digital things, you know, printers and things that are not really too spacious but save you uh, a lot of headache. You don't have to have casts, you know, on this attic of your practice for five years. Everything can be digital. Your practice can smell good. Uh, in our case, uh, you know, we have all kinds of software because being in, in Auburn, Alabama, there's no lab that can do what I was trained to do. And so it's kind of frustrating. You know, you like do your case, have your physical records, have your digital records, your digital designs of all your, the processes you're going to do and send it to a lab, let's say in New York. And they have all these cases from, I don't know, David Tarna or whoever. And they're, you know, they're top clients in New York. They don't know who I am. It's like, oh, this is from Alabama. So the case is sitting there for like six weeks. And it takes six weeks to get like a, a record base on a tight, you know, on a wax stream on a tight base. So it's, it's kind of insulting. So you can just get the things and do it yourself or get somebody that can do it 